from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi. On behalf of the Hebraic section, welcome to the African and Middle Eastern Reading Room. I'm Sharon Horowitz, reference librarian in the Hebraic section. Our speaker today is Professor Howard Wettstein. Professor Wettstein received his PhD at the City University of New York, and he has been a professor of philosophy at the University of California, Riverside since 1989, and he has been chair of their Department of Philosophy and director of the University Honors Program. He held previous teaching positions at the University of Notre Dame and the University of Minnesota Morris. He is the author of many scholarly articles, two previous books on the philosophy of language, and he has edited several books of collected articles. Professor Wettstein is also the editor of the journal Midwest Studies in Philosophy. Today, Professor Wettstein will speak about his new book, The Significance of Religious Experience. The book is a collection of personal essays written over a period of time. Because of the way his own experiences and general concepts of the philosophy of religion are interwoven, we will hear more about the book's content directly from Professor Wettstein. And now, please join me in welcoming Professor Howard Wettstein. Um, I thought I would do three things. First. Um, tell you a little about my own religious life and religious development, um, something that uh, I discuss in chapter two. Um, part of what I'm up to in this book is uh, something that's both a personal project and an intellectual project, and so the personal stuff comes in in a very important way, I think, and we'll see how you feel. So I'm going to talk a little about my own religious development and life and then turn to a kind of overview of the book in terms of, I'm going to motivate the project, in, uh, and I'll say more about that as when we get there. Okay. First, uh, I come from a secular American Jewish family. We belong to a conservative synagogue, but we're unobservant. Um, I was an awful student in high school, and Yeshiva University was the best place I could get into, and my father was a basketball coach there, and uh, wanted me to go. But the last thing he wanted was for me to become religious. And then the minute I set foot on campus, I learned that I had a mind, and I learned that I was really quite excited about religion. Um, it was stunning in ways I never, ever expected. Um, the sense of intellectual community, the students and the faculty. Um, I had a Bible teacher who was, it was a beginner's program. I didn't know anything, and know anything by way of Jewish education, really. I went to Hebrew school, but if you've seen the movie A Serious Man, the Coen Brothers movie, the Hebrew school is not bad. It was some Woody Allen movie. Either one would do. Um, I think the function of those schools is to kind of uh, create a sense of alienation that you never quite le le lose. Okay. So I was really excited to be at Yeshiva. And uh, the more I got into the study, I, had a I was about to say I had a Bible teacher who was uh, just a wonderful person and uh, loved questions. He was an Orthodox rabbi and loved questions. The, the harder questions you asked, the better, more happy he was, as long as they were serious and sincere. And it was really wonderful. I'd never been exposed to anything like that in my life before. Um, and as I got into it, I started to study first Bible and then Mishnah and Gemara. Um, and uh, I found those things just overwhelming and fascinating and, I don't know, life-affirming. It was just an am amazing experience. At the same time, I had doubts all the time about the theological basics because I didn't know how to deal with that exactly. Well, I'll, I'm going to come back to this later. Rel relig when people get caught up in religious life or moved by it, it's a bit like falling in love, except there's no free lunch. So it comes with a bunch of theoretical ideas about the world that somehow are part and parcel of it. And uh, somehow that always bothered me. That's probably why philosophy was a natural fit for me, because I wanted to see how all this would, would make sense. 
So I would think to myself, I love this stuff, but on the other hand, why are my beliefs better than the guy down the street or what I used to think a, a year ago? How does that work? Um, I had a kind of philosophical conscience and it really was powerful. So I struggled, but as I got more and more into the Talmudic learning especially, um, I forgot about it. It, 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 it kind of receded. And then, I, so I did this for five years. I spread out college over an extra year to do more Jewish studies. And I jumped from this beginner's program to a kind of advanced Talmudic class. Um, my teacher, some, some of you may know, his name was Rabbi Lichtenstein. And it was quite an amazing experience. He was, I walked into his class the first day. I had prepared the text before. And I heard what he was saying. And I thought, my god, I got to stay here. I'm going to learn how to think. And I spent two years with him, and it was really quite amazing. Um, and then, so I spread out college over five years, and then I entered the rabbinical, the smicha program, the rabbinical program. And uh, I was, te over the summer, I was teaching Talmud to people who were less advanced in a camp. And uh, it was a camp that Yeshiva University had owned and operated. It, just, it had just started, actually. And... Uh, I would work all day on Talmudic stuff, except for basketball breaks, which we took. And uh, in the evenings, I'd drive myself crazy about what I believe and does this make any sense. And I would think through the arguments over and over and over again. And I was really struggling. And by the end of the summer, I thought, I can't do this. Uh, I love the material and I love the community, but I can't do this. I, I'm not, it doesn't, doesn't really cohere for me in a way that I can live with. So I um, really left. I left yeshiva and left religious life and for about 25 years didn't have much to do with it except through my wife who remained observant. Uh, she grew up in, in a modern orthodox family which I didn't and, uh, and we worked on how to do this with a kind of mixed marriage and it was interesting in all kinds of ways. Um, we had two kids. We lived in crazy places because academia is like that. My first job was in a small school in Minnesota. And uh, there was a scene one winter of me waving down a Greyhound bus on the highway, which had a shipment of kosher meat uh, in the middle of the winter. It was kind of crazy. And then uh, there was a guy, there was a Jewish guy, very few Jews in the, in, in the community, but there was a biologist who was Jewish. And when we came, in my wife's honor, he built a sukkah the first year. And he said he always wanted to do it, and he never did it. And he built a sukkah. And then a friend of ours came to see it who was... Uh, not Jewish, and he said, oh boy, now I know why they don't let Jews into the Carpenters Union. <laughs> let me get some water if I can. So we lived in a bunch of crazy places. The last job I had before moving to California was at Notre Dame and I'll talk a bit more about that soon. Um, I was the village atheist at Notre Dame. It was kind of interesting. Uh, when they hired me, they knew I was Jewish. They knew I had a b background. They knew that my wife was re religious. I don't know how that came across to them. And they were very happy, but when they found out that I wasn't, they weren't nearly as happy. Um, but it was okay. Um, I had fun with them. I was the village atheist in the department, and there were several others of us. Um, but it was strange. Here's an, here's an episode. I, it was a graduate student who got an MD degree uh, from UC, Ur, UC Davis and came to Notre Dame to get a PhD in philosophy. He wanted to do what, what he called Christian psychiatry. And um, I would talk to him a lot. I liked him very much. And we, we took a walk one day, and we saw an anthill and a bunch of ants and doing their thing. And he said to me, if I didn't have God, life would be as meaningless as that, right? We'd all be just doing our thing and then it would be over. So I said to him, you know, that's kind of funny because I know religious people for whom it's as empty as that. And I know people who are not religious for whom life is full. So I don't know exactly how this is supposed to work. So anyway, I had fun there. It was kind of good. I, I, I was always interested in religion, and even when I wasn't a participant, I had a lot of respect for it and, and the like. Okay, so if I spent 25 years really uh, divorced from these things, and then it started to re-enter my life in a kind of powerful way. 
uh, partly due to incidents that happen. For example, um, I went to a conference in 1990 in Jerusalem uh, in honor of a philosopher named David Kaplan at UCLA, and I didn't actually want to go because I had issues with the Israeli-Palestinian stuff, and, uh, but my wife really wanted to go, and we'd never been there. And uh, we got to Israel, and we landed on a Friday afternoon, and the custom, customs agent said to me, Shabbat Shalom, and I fell apart. I just, I think I started to cry. I mean, it was amazing. And I said to myself, this is what my, Michael Corleone must have felt when he went to Sicily, you know? <laughs> I felt this homecoming sense that I never expected, and it was very, very powerful. Um, and since then, I've been going back every summer, and I study Talmud for three weeks um, there with a guy in a yeshiva. Um, okay. So it was starting to come back to me. I went to Israel. My mother died, which was a major factor in all of this. Somehow it was, I wasn't that close to her, and somehow I thought it wouldn't be so bad, but it was awful. And uh, spiritual stuff started to enter in a way that was very helpful. I started to say Kaddish for her, um, and just in a lot of other ways. I remember calling home one night. I was, they were in Florida, and we were in Minnesota, maybe, or India. I don't know where we were, but... I called home one night and I was really upset. Um, this was during Shiva, I think. And uh, my wife said, my wife is a psychologist who's here. She said to me something like, you know, you're so hungry for meaning in all of this, which was true. That's what I, my project was. Um, you're not leaving any room to just feel bad. Um, so it was a real growing time. It was such a growing time religiously and spiritually that I kind of would feel guilty. It was as if I was using my mother's death as a way to, to get somewhere, and I didn't like that idea. Okay, so at that point it starts to come back, and I remember talking to a fellow who's a dean at NYU. He's an old friend of mine. He used to be the chair at Notre Dame when I was there. And I said, you know, I want to spend my time in philosophy really thinking about these issues, about making sense of religion to myself. Because I hadn't really resolved all the questions that caused me to leave, and yet I felt myself moving back. It was very strange. Um, so I just want to check the time. Um, and he said, uh, and I said, my colleague's going to think I'm nuts. I'm thinking about the philosophy of language for like all these years. I'm thinking about the meaning of language and reference and very abstract kinds of questions. And then the next day, I'm going to start talking about God. They're going to think I'm nuts. And he said, you have tenure, don't you? So I said, yes. So I wrote somewhere about this, and I said, maybe that's why God created tenure. You know? OK. So I'm happy to answer more questions about it later. But let me move on to, um, to more of the content of the book, or an overview of the motivation for the book. I have a lot of trouble with synagogues, um, but there's one in Jerusalem that I fell completely in love with. It's a place called Yakar, and it was very musical and very powerful somehow. And uh, the rabbi used to do the Friday night service himself, and it, it was just amazing. He was musically gifted. In fact, that was the way his spirituality expressed itself. And. Uh, it was a small room, much smaller than this, kind of a small room with about two, 300 people singing in spontaneous harmonies. It was really very powerful. And I looked around one night and I asked myself, so what's going on here? You know, what's the emotion? What's happening? And I thought, what I hear, what I feel from everybody is a kind of longing. And it made me think about, you know, how finite life is and how how much longing there is be in, for each of us in very different ways about our occupations, about our, how long our lives last, about the fact that they end, about the fact that, I don't know, we have trouble with our children and they have trouble with us. And there's a, there's a lot of incompleteness in life, essential incompleteness. Um, and somehow religion touches that. You can kind of somehow singing about it in the context of the whole group was very powerful. You felt a release in a way. It was really important. And I, I feel like that's a lot what we're up to in what I'm up to and what, in a way, religion is up to, to bring us in touch with these very deep human things and be able to experience them together and think, feel them. Um, 
the miracle of birth is a, a moment of, I think, great religious importance. Um, in the book of Job, there's a, a line from God at the end about how you say, he says to Job, have you, have you ever looked through the gates of death? And it's very powerful, very powerful to get into the, the imagery. Um, there's a movie called Thin Red Line, which is about the battle for Guadalcanal, and it's a Malik movie. Um, he, what's so powerful about it is the juxtaposition of images of great physical beauty, the Guadalcanal was just incredible, with human horror, and the two of them together are somehow spiritually very important in a way, that bringing these two things together. Um, there's a book by Annie Dillard called P Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, it won a Pulitzer Prize, and she's uh, somewhere in the, in the east, in the east, eastern part of the country, not far from here, I think, for she's alone, a woman alone for the summer, living out in the woods. And she talks about scenes of amazing beauty juxtaposed with scenes of amazing horror. And somehow it's like, it's very, she doesn't talk, she never mentions God, but it's somehow very spiritually moving. Um, so, you know, like other people who are moved by life issues or something and end up going to church or synagogue or mosque, I don't know, over time I felt myself more and more drawn in and alive and able to kind of somehow deal with big things because of this. But as I said, there's no free lunch. So I want to talk about that because that's where philosophy comes in. Um, it's as if you fall in love and a lot of beliefs tag along about the origin of the universe or, um, I don't know, all the things that you know that are central to religious belief, the existence of a, sup of a supernatural domain and all the rest. In philosophy, we call this metaphysics. A metaphysical picture means a kind of theoretical picture about what's going on in the world. So what we think of as the standard religious metaphysical picture means it's not just the natural world we all live in, but maybe there's an afterlife where you, you kind of migrate to a spiritual domain. Maybe it's a domain where God, as it were, lives, whatever that is supposed to mean. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff about uh, providence, about Things don't just happen, they happen for a reason and they're being directed. And there's a whole system. So it's tempting to think about, I mean, we, we speak of religious people as believers, that's the idiom. As if the belief in the picture is at the heart of the game. And if, you, if you're kind of uh, drawn to philosophy, this is problematic. It's problematic because if, you, if somebody came to you with this picture independently of religion, just said, here's the way the world is. You'd say, well, why should I think that way? I see the natural world and I, what's going on? So I felt it as an undergraduate, but in general, there's a, I mean, you might call this the ethics of belief. Um, it seems to be important for the most important beliefs you have to be motivated by more than you'd like them to be true and they feel right. Right? especially in the face of lots of people who think differently about it. And the question is, you know, what, how do you deal with this prejudice towards yourself in a certain kind of way? So for me, that's been a life, lo lifetime struggle. Um, and I don't mean it as harsh as it sounds, because I don't walk around judging people this way. I, but, but somehow, for me, it was really, really very important. Does that make sense? People get a hold of that, that contrast between, you know, you're drawn to a, it's like falling in love, I, I think. You're drawn to it, you just, it speaks to you and you're really there. Um, but along with it comes a whole set of beliefs that you, ah, like that, okay. I'm doing the academic thing where you shuffle your papers and you don't know what's next.
Actually, I don't know what's next. Okay, I'll just bring it. So I think what's next is this. I want to talk about um, my project in this book, but not, it wasn't a book, it was just things I wrote was to kind of make sense of this for myself, to see how it is that I'm going to make sense of this sense of falling in love and sense of having meaning brought into my life in very significant ways, and yet not knowing how to deal with these other issues. And you might think of them as intellectual issues, but they're not just intellectual issues. They become per personal issues. I want to understand what, what I'm doing. OK. The beginning might be, the, from, at least in my path, the beginning um, is like this. I, I'm about in my mid-40s, and uh, I'm a very analytical kind of person. When I was younger, I couldn't read poetry, for example. And there's a place for music, but I couldn't read poetry. I just couldn't connect to it. It was too mushy, and I didn't know what was going on. And there's a, a great Jewish thinker named Abraham Joshua Heschel, who in the end has had a... I've, it's been a wonderful experience working through his work. And uh, I couldn't read him as a young man. It just was too mushy for me. Uh, but my mid-40s, I remember driving around campus one day, and NPR had a, poet, a reading of a poem by a contemporary American who I really appreciate nowadays called Stephen Dunn. He lives in New Jersey. Um, and I thought, my god, I can follow this. It really make, I, It was a great moment. So I started to read poetry, and I. Um, I started to read and listen to some of the, the talks of Robert Bly, who's a very interesting American poet. Um, and all of a sudden, it's, it seems important to me that the Bible is so heavily poetry and poetically infused narrative. And equally important, if you think about the, the Talmud in its discussions of law, which are highly analytical. In fact, Rabbi Lichtenstein's teaching, to me, was the greatest introduction to analytic philosophy because he really learned how to sort out the ideas and define and conceptual clarification. Um, if you, the way the Talmud works is there'll be a, a legal discussion. And then at some point, various times and places, it, there's a kind of trend, since it's, a, um, it's really a, a a record of the discussions in the ancient academies, it will switch from law to what you might call theology. But theology in this context is never doctrine. You're supposed to believe this. And you're supposed, I shouldn't say never. There are exceptions. But law, it's hardly ever doctrine. It's not like a catechism or stuff you're supposed to believe. It's stories, stories with lots of poetry and storytelling and stories about the sages, stories about God. And they're very, very important and powerful. But they, is, you know, if you're looking to this literature for an introduction to theology in the way we know it, it doesn't, it's not there. So that's starting to seem very important to me. Maybe I have the wrong impression of, of all of what you, how you deal with religion in a way. And then Heschel points out, and actually lots of people talk about this now, I see now, um, but it was really news to me. It probably will be news to some of you. Um, there's no word for belief in the Bible. Isn't that strange? If the central concept is what you believe, it's very odd that there's no word, there's no, Heschel says there's, you can't even descri describe someone as a believer because there's no natural language to do that. I mean, you could, you could language to make it happen, but there's no natural language to do that. And he says that in Islam, a, uh, a religious person is called mumin, which mean, comes from, in he the same root in Hebrew is ma'amin, which means belief. And so we've, we've come to use it as belief. Uh, but he says in Hebrew, the closest you come to biblical idea seems to be that of the yirei shamayim, one who stands in awe of heaven. And standing in awe of heaven is very different than having a set of metaphysical beliefs. So I'm starting to think about the whole thing in a somewhat different way, right? Because I start with the idea that religion is essentially this set of beliefs about the world. And then I, the part having to do with affect and meaning and all that stuff is starting to grow in importance. Um, then I had a look at the work of a 20th century rabbi named Max Kedushin, who hasn't read that much. 
he wrote a book called The Rabbinic Image that's really terrific and was really important to me. Um, he says, we have lots of beliefs, he calls them dogmas in Judaism, but they're uncrystallized. He means something like they're imagistic. You don't really have a theoretical idea. So when the Bible says that um, people are created in God's image, so first of all, it uses the word image, but independently of using the word image, it, it's an imagistic kind of thing. I mean, what exactly is it to be created in God's image? Is there a theoretical idea there? Well, I mean, it's too harsh to say no theoretical idea, but it, but it, but it isn't a well-defined concept. Um, it reminds me a bit, and maybe come back to this, of um, in American... Um, political thought, all men are created equal, plays a tremendous role in policy and our attitudes. Um, but if you ask 15 philosophers what it means, they become like Jews and you get like 17 answers, right? Who knows what that means exactly? In what way? It doesn't seem right when you start to analyze it, but it's really important. Well, a lot of the, th the beliefs we have are really like that. Um, Think about creation, the creation of the world, especially if you think it's creation from nothing, which is a sort of controversial idea, but a mainstream Jewish theological idea. I don't know. My understanding of it is about at the level of, did you see Tree of Life, that movie? Some of you? There are, there's a lot of creation images. That's about the closest I get. Uh, when I'm told that there's a supernatural domain, which is so to speak, the residence of God. Do I know what I'm talking about exactly? I know it's not supposed to be like here. It's spirit, but what, what exactly are we talking about? I, I don't actually know what I'm talking about. It's kind of an image. Um, and the idea of God is very imagistic in a way. Uh, on one hand, we have the anthropomorphic ways of characterizing God, and people in Jewish tradition certainly think they, that can't be quite right that God is good in the sense that we are, or can't be altogether wrong because then the whole thing wouldn't cohere, but that can't be quite right. And then there's the, the whole set of omni properties, omniscient and omnipotent and so on. You don't find any of those so far as I could see in the Bible, but they've become, main, through philosophy, they've become kind of almost definitive for everybody of God. But if you go back to the Bible, it's more like this. I have a friend who grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home, and he says that talk about God was kind of, a, you know, commonplace, like talk of the weather. And as well defined as about the weather was for all of us. We, you know, there's a way in which you don't know what you're talking about, but you're talking about it, and it makes a lot of sense, and you know what you're talking about, right? Um, so these, these ideas that suffer in a way you might say from a lack of clarity I put that in quotes because I don't, it's a funny way to put it. They do their work quite well. They really facilitate what I started to describe at the beginning with longing and with, with, with the meaning, with meaning in life. And they, they work in prayer and they work, they work. But their working doesn't depend on their being well defined. It's a bit like this. Maybe this example would help if I have time. Let me see. Yeah, soon. Um, imagine that, it's from a chapter in the book actually, imagine that um, your family has always lived on this big piece of property along with other families. It's been a tradition. All of you have lived there forever, so far as you know, going back. And no one ever has um, talked about where the boundaries are because it didn't matter. We all live in this, it's like a courtyard or something. You all live in this big piece of property and you have, right? Um, now, if, if, if it becomes politically important to draw boundaries, you'll find a way to do it. But the boundaries will be to some extent arbitrary and not built into the original situation and you can't, that's a kind of model for some of these concepts. You can try to kind of refine them and define them and kind of make them precise, 
But in doing that, there's a kind of arbitrariness to it. And the work they did didn't depend on precision. It, it depended on other stuff. So I love Kedushin's idea that the beliefs we have so-called are uncrystallized. OK. What I hope that will do is give you a sense of a different way to look at it. I don't think that at the core, I mean, I, I don't want sort of the way it works for me is I don't want to think at the core is a picture, of, a metaphysical picture of the world with the supernatural and all the rest of it. I feel like at the core are these imagistic ideas embedded in a tradition that we live with and make sense of our lives in all kinds of ways. Um, let's see how to put this. Um, I feel like, I don't know, you know, this is a bold historical claim, so take it for what it's worth, but I, when, you, when you read biblical literature and then you see that the Talmud is working in a rather similar way in terms of the legal as separate, from, I, not similar in all respects, different in lots of ways, but um, when the legal, when you get a legal passage that becomes a passage of what, what is called a gadita, of uh, sort of theological, it's not theological in the doctrinal sense. So I'm tem tempted to think this whole theological thing that we ended up with after the Middle Ages, it doesn't seem that native. Here's another way to, to put the point. Uh, the Talmud sometimes talks about a rabbi arguing with a philosopher. Um, the rabbi always wins, I think. I, the philosophical mentality was, in the dom was starting to enter the domain, but they didn't want it somehow. They had the feeling, this is not what we want to do with our, with our stuff. This is, not, this is not the native way. There was some kind of sense that um, th we call it theology, that theology is really all about edification and giving meaning to the practices. It's a way to round out the life in a way that makes sense. But they didn't have any idea, so far as I know, of a theoretical enterprise of discerning the, the real universe. Okay. So anyway, that's at the bottom of the book, a way to try for myself to make sense of religious life in a way that doesn't involve what I found to be beliefs that are very difficult. It's, it's not motivated by, um, it's, not, it's not as if you start with a system of belief and then there's religious life and you think I find the beliefs hard so let me find a way to interpret the whole thing that doesn't involve them. It might sound like that but that really isn't what it was like for me. It was more like trying to work through the thing in a way that, what's really going on here? What's really the picture? Okay, so we can come back to any of this you'd like to. Um, I wanna turn now uh, for the last 10 minutes or so to the ethical side. Um, it's usually thought that the picture of God, again, this goes back to the, I think the medieval inspired, and in Jewish connection, medieval inspired picture of God is omniscient and omnipotent. He knows everything and he's all powerful and perfectly just. So far as I can tell, none of those are part of the biblical picture because God's complicated biblically. Um, but it's always seen as a problem of how you how you deal with the obvious awfulness of the universe. I don't mean it's just awful, it's also exquisite and amazing, but it's awful. Uh, how to deal with that in terms of a theological picture? Does it make any sense? So I went to a conference, I'll try to make this quick and I won't do it as, as fully because I wanna leave time for questions. Uh, I went to a conference at Notre Dame in which it was really basically a fight between the Christians and the atheists, okay? They were talking about parts of the Bible in which God seems to mandate awful things. You know, he tells Joshua, when you enter the land, kill everybody. Not just the warriors, but kill the people, kill the babies, kill the animals. And 
you know. When I was growing up, I feel like in Christianity, the feeling was that was the Old Testament and it's been superseded, but that's, that's not the way people look at it nowadays. So Notre Dame, the, um, it was a project to kind of see what to say about God. What, could, what, could, what can we say about God? So the answers I thought were pretty awful. Um, they were answers in the tradition of theodicy, if you know that word, it means, it means justifying God. And uh, you know about theodicy probably, even if you don't know the word, because it has to do with things like saying that, you know, the most awful things that happened would make a lot of sense, for example, if you could see it from God's point of view. That's an example of a theodicy kind of idea. Um, or that you don't really know what good means to God. You only have your own conception. That's another kind of theodicy idea. So this, these could be explored in great length. But um, there were all kinds of theodicies that were flying. Um, at one point, somebody, a, Brit a famous British theologian named Swinburne, said that, um, how do you know it's bad for babies to die? Maybe it's better to be with God than it is to be here. And I thought, this is the end, right? I'm, I'm resigning. Um, so anyway, so it was the Christians and the atheists. The atheist was saying, we know you people think that way. That's why we, don't want, we want no part of it, right? And they let me go last. And I was the only Jewish participant. And it turned out to be on Shabbat. So um, I couldn't use a microphone. I was just standing on stage. People were reading formal papers. And all I could do was give a talk. And it was fine. I had a lot of fun. Um, and I said, you know, you, you people are talking about how awful it is the way God treats his enemies, as in Joshua. But it's, we should make the problem worse before we make it better. Think about the way he treats his beloved, as in the Akedah, the story of Abraham and Isaac and God commanding Abraham to kill his child. And Job, as God says, Job is um, the most righteous man on earth. And then complete awfulness happens. Um, so I started to talk about that. And it's, the arcade is too hard, but let me talk about Job just a, for a couple of minutes. Um, Job is said by God at the beginning of the book to be the most righteous man on earth. And then a character called the Satan, which it's tempting to translate as Satan, but it doesn't mean the Satan of Christian tradition. It means something like, you know, like a, a heavenly prosecuting attorney who wanders around to try to find who's up to what. So he says to God, maybe, um, this is a very radical book, as you'll see. Um, he says to God, maybe Job has been so good because you give him everything. Take it all away and let's see how good he is, see if, how much he loves you. Jung, the psychologist, C.G. Jung, says that this character, the, Avenger, the, uh, the accuser, is really God's insecurity. I think is really interesting. Um, does he really love me? Does he really love me? Is it because he's gotten everything? So they take away, they kill his children. Um, they take away his wealth. And then the, the accuser comes back to God and God says, you see, I won. He's still with me, even though. And he says, well, that's because you haven't touched him. Let's, let's kind of give him physically a hard time because people then won't stick with you. And uh, God says, okay, but don't kill him. And they take away his health and it's all gone. His children are gone. His wife has left him because she's sick with the whole thing. Um, so he's went from, he was the richest man in the East, whatever that means, and he's become, his, his life is just just completely awful. And uh, the book's funny because the first two chapters, you know, is one, somebody translated it as Once Upon a Time because it reads like a fairy tale, right? And it may be that its point is not, um, it's widely seen to be a parable. Um, maybe its point is not a historical story between God meeting this character, but rather a way to put dramatically the feeling that awful things just happen in life and then not a matter of whether you deserve them or not. So anyway, the book proceeds, and then Job, three of his friends who um, come to be with him in his, and mourn with him, and they sit quietly for a whole week. This is probably the origin of our, I don't know if it's the origin, but it's some related to Jewish mourning practices where you sit shiva. 
So they sit with him for a whole week and they don't say a word. But then I forget where it starts, whether with him or with them. Emotion starts to burst and he's crazy. He never, I mean, the Bible doesn't know about belief in belief that God exists. It's not a concept it ever deals with. So he never questions that there's a God and he's, he's related to God in certain way, but he, he questions what the hell's going on? This is the most awful, I mean, what about justice? What about all the things we've come to, to believe? Um, so his friends, the book is wonderful because it makes fun of these very conventional religious types who say to him, no, 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 you must have done something terrible. And we, the reader, know it's not true because the book's told us it's not true. You must have done something terrible. Fall on your knees and pray and God will take you back. And they just pound away at all these conventional things that we hear all the time. And the book's kind of telling you, forget about them. They don't make any sense. It's really quite a, a dramatic thing. At the... At, at his very lowest point, he's sitting on a pile of ashes. He's lost everything, and he's ill, and his skin is crawling, and he's scraping it with a piece of pot, broken pottery. At his lowest point, God shows up, which is really interesting, right? Because God shows up at low points and high points. It's very hard in the middle. Um, God shows up at his lowest point, and uh, then there's this speech from the whirlwind, which if you haven't read, I really recommend it. It's really quite an astounding thing. And uh, it's too much to do now, but um, let me just give you a, an approach to it that appeals to me. Um, it needs to, it's very controversial how to read this. It, it, the Book of Job is the most magnificent Hebrew poetry, but the key lines that would make you read it one way or another way are all controversial. The Hebrew is very hard. Um, so my picture goes like this. In, in my picture, come God, in a way, takes him from this spot, although he always sits in the spot, never moves, really. But it's as if it took him by the hand to the top of the mountain. And God says to him, in a kind of harsh way, which needs explanation, I'm going to tell you what this looks like to me, the world. I'm going to share my vision of the world with you. And God becomes a poet and it's really powerful. And the poetry talks about how exquisite things are and how God is himself awestruck by how amazing it is, but also how awful it is and how you know, this animal eats that animal and you get that picture that I got from Annie Dillard and the, and the, um, the other thing I mentioned. Um, anyway, at the end of this whole tour, it's really a tour of the universe, what it all looks like. I don't mean geographically. Um, Job is stunned, and somehow he has come to make peace. And you wonder, why has he made peace? He hasn't gotten the answers to his questions. He doesn't know about justice any more than he did before. But he's stunned by, he's awestruck, and he doesn't expect answers anymore. And people read the book as, you know, we're too dumb or lowly to get the answers, but they're there. The book doesn't, to me, suggest anything like answers. It just su suggests it's an exquisite and amazing and awful place. And the guy becomes, God becomes a poet. And I don't know, those experiences for me, were, were the moments at which I can, um, I don't know, Look at, it, look at my life from above, a very powerful moments. And they have a way of making you not feel so much about the things you're going through right now. Your own issues look much smaller. There's a book that when I teach this, I can't resist telling you this, also my brother's here. Um, there's a book by Bill Russell called Second Wind, the famous basketball guy. And he talks in this book about what basketball is like at the, at the highest moment. And he says, it only happens when the Celtics were playing somebody really terrific. And uh, all of a sudden, we'd all be playing our hearts out. And all of a sudden, it's as if I was elevated. It's as if I was looking at the game from above. And he talks, it's a kind of transcendent thing. It's really quite powerful and beautiful. I recommend it. Um, and he says, when I got there, I could kind of anticipate where the ball was going before it got there. And... 
I didn't care who won or lost. I was way above that. It was like seeing basketball as kind of ballet. Anyway, he writes this stuff, and it's really powerful. I teach it in connection with this, or I read that passage in connection with this, because when you get there, all the issues look small. You have to go back to Earth at some point. They're not so small. But in a way, that's what God does for me, right? Perspective and sharing and... I don't, I don't know. So if this works, you get a sense of where I'm coming from. I'm not really saying it very, very well. Um, there's a friend, of my, a, a rabbi in my community in L.A. who said to someone, you know, forget the answers. If God puts his hand on my shoulder when it's getting rough, that's, that's plenty. So I feel like, as with the first part, the first part was about more metaphysics and epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. It was about belief and justifying those beliefs. And I try to say, wait, it, it's not obvious that the, this approach to life requires quite that. Here, too, I have the same feeling in a way that what religion really does for people is bring meaning and perspective and comfort and community and all kinds of things that don't depend on the kind of answers that we conventionally look for or think religion is really all about. I had a student who, um, a Protestant student, who said that he um, went to a funeral in church of a young guy who was killed. And the pastor said something like, maybe he was killed to teach us this lesson. And the guy thought, that would be obscene if this young man died to teach me some stupid lesson. Where's the justice in that? It's hard to see what kind of story would ever mean justice. Okay, so anyway, let me end with that. That's an overview of the kinds of uh, ideas that are in the book. And let me get questions. Discussion, yeah. What is your name? Rocky Core. You said that at the beginning of your life, so to speak, you began in a secular situation. I did. Yes. In later life, for all these reasons you've been talking about, you came back. The way you describe your coming back is in a wonderful, general way of approaching it. But, but in the Jewish context, as you came back, how did that dovetail with, let's say, modern divisions in Judaism, theological differences, yes. Borowitz to Heschel to Uber? How did you come back with a sort of a pan approach to your identity, even in the Jewish community? Dealing with the larger issues, so to speak, or do you affiliate now or do you have yeah. a sense of belonging to one part of that community? Yeah. Um, very good question. Uh, I was told to repeat the question, but that's. I was, no, I was once at a conference and this woman gave a, asked a question that took 20 minutes, and I was chairing the session and I said, Would you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question is this story I told, how it fits with denominationalism and Judaism and where I fit exactly and how I've made peace with all of this. So it's really hard and my wife is smiling because um, so I, I live as an Orthodox Jew. Um, I study Talmud and I try to pray three times a day and eat kosher and, and the rest. Um, when I started coming back, we were living in a rural community at the time. It didn't have an Orthodox synagogue. We went to a conservative synagogue. And for my wife, it was a compromise, but it was a place that we could live and I could work where I did and so on. And I started to get into it. Um, I, I participated with them, but it didn't feel that satisfying with me. I feel like if you've been in the yeshiva, you never quite get over it, right? Um, I don't mean this judgmentally, but just how it felt to me. It felt to me... Okay, so, um, so then we moved to Los Angeles and we went first to a conservative synagogue and then to an Orthodox synagogue. We moved to Los Angeles largely to kind of uh, connect the Jewish community because we didn't have it where we lived. And uh, so we started going to a conservative synagogue and then we went to an Orthodox, modern Orthodox synagogue. And uh, then I decided, I don't like this. Why didn't I like it? Well, I like the people and I like the attitudes, but they don't know how to pray, I felt like. You know, that when I went to a real right-wing place, 
that I couldn't talk to the people quite at all, you know. Um, they know what the, they know how to pray, and I, 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 the rabbi in this right wing place, the yeshiva, um, once gave a horrible talk about Palestinians, and he looked at me and he said, "I saw daggers in your eyes," and I said, "That's right," you know. Um, so, I don't know if you develop a reputation as weird, you can get away with things. So, I, I don't like the denominational breakdown at all. Um, one of the most interesting things that's going on in LA is not is by a, a rabbi, a woman named um, Sharon Browse. It's called Ikar, and she's creative and interesting and honest and open. And I, you know, I I can't pray in their place because it's not me, but I appreciate it very much. So I think the denominational thing is awful, um, and I hope I've learned from Heschel and from Kedushin and such and, and such people. Um, but what I want is a life of traditional practice informed by, and for me, somehow at the heart of that life for me, this is what happened to me when I was at yeshiva, was learning. You know, as, as people know, rabbis who are trained don't learn theology. That's not the main deal. It's Talmud, and it's legal, and it, but it's, it's probably the most fantastic thing I've ever studied. It's just an amazing experience. So is that, is that responsible? I don't fit anywhere. I really don't fit anywhere. Um, there's a line that's attributed to lots of different people. It goes like this. I can't pray with the people I can talk to, and I can't talk to the people I can pray with. And you know, people in other traditions feel this as well sometimes. Somebody else? Anything at all? Yeah? You mentioned after Yeshiva University, you were going into an ordination program? Yes, that's at Yeshiva University. Uh, were you looking for a congregational type of event, or were you going to be No. <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I knew that the next step was to get ordination because it meant the next step in scholarship. It wasn't to be, you know, and I, I never wanted to be a synagogue. And, a leader in that in that way. I wanted to teach somehow. I didn't know what it would be like. I didn't have a good idea of where or what. Can I follow up? Today, Please. Would you continue on the ordination? Do you feel uncomfortable? So my wife asked me this. Uh, Did you get me five? No, I didn't. I no, I quit. I I quit because I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't do it because there was a guy there. There was a rabbi in the school who I used to talk to all the time about Talmud. And he wasn't my teacher, but I liked him a lot. But he, he was very kind of um, fierce in his religious faith. And at the end, he said to me at one point, I think maybe you should leave. And I, it, but it wasn't nasty. It really, it really wasn't nasty. And I said, you're right, and I am. I have applications. And, um, and I, hadn't, I hadn't talked to him for 40 years or something. I got a call about a year ago. He's in Brooklyn in some very heavy duty community. And he said, I'm turning 80, and I need closure on my old relationships. I heard that you were learning again. So I said, yeah, I am. It's kind of, well. Your applications in, are you now going? No, 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 no. So my wife asked me, I, I go every summer to learn in Israel in the yeshiva. I'm probably the only person in the world that learns in the yeshiva and gives talks at Al-Quds University in the afternoon in a Palestinian place. So I came to the yeshiva one day with an Arab water bottle, you know, like this, but with Arabic. And we looked at it, me and my, the guy I learned with, and we laughed. It was very funny. Um, so uh, my wife asked me, if you retire, which I have no plans on doing, w w would you like to get smicha? Would you like to be a rabbi? And I thought, I don't want, I don't, I wouldn't do that particularly. It's not, I want to keep lear learning and growing in the stuff, but I, I don't, yeah. You have no objection to it, do you? Just, no. You just don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, I have objection to the life of many um, synagogue rabbis. I know. I mean, I don't mean objection, but I mean I feel for them. Yeah. And I was talking to uh, the rabbi in L.A. who we connect with, and um, he was making fun of me about academia, about all the baloney that goes on. And I said, "Yeah, I know it's true." Um, but the other thing is, I love teaching, and there are days I think they shouldn't pay me for this. It's just so wonderful. 
And he said, I don't know if I ever feel that way. <laughs> thank you. Thank sure. you very much. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. And also to tell you that uh, Dr. Wetstein's book is for sale in the back. If anyone is interested, I'm sure Dr. Wetstein would be happy to uh, sign it if anybody wants. And thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.